yeah. you put the, a young mouse's microbiome into an old mouse and interesting things happen. So very broadly speaking, how do these experiments work and what are some of the, the high level changes that you guys observe with respect to aging and immunity? Okay. No, Grace. Um, great question. So I'll rewind a little bit just to give listeners a, a little bit more context about, about why we would think about doing this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so what my lab is really interested in doing is understanding this relationship between the microbiome and the gut brain axis at key windows across the lifespan. So we have programs in early life in the perinatal period in adolescence and all the way into, into old age and buoyed by experiments in humans that my colleagues here in Cork did. Oh, it's almost a decade ago now where they showed in a, a project called ElderMet, that elderly individuals who tended to live in nursing homes and um, assisted living, um, that their microbiomes um, had a reduction in diversity um, as they aged. And um, this Carl. Um, frailty and other health outcomes. So the people who lived in the community then who had um, very much diverse, more, more diverse microbiomes had less frailty. And so, so and, and they went one step further to show that it was driven by diet. So the people with the more diverse diets had the, more, had the most um, diverse microbiome than, and were less likely to be frail. Now, so that was kind of interesting, but I'm a neuroscientist, so I was a bit disappointed there was not a lot, there wasn't a lot of neuroscience in that study, even though it was in nature, but it, was, it, it didn't have, it wasn't uh, driven from a cognitive or um, uh, neuroimmunology perspective. There, there was a, a peripheral immune measures. Um, but we were kind of excited about it. And it, rem uh, it reminded us of Eli Metchnikoff's work at the turn of the last century. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Eli Metchnikoff, Nick. Okay. No. And, and Eli Metchnikoff is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of timely. He was a Ukrainian Russian um, working in Paris who um, won the Nobel Prize in 1908 for discovering the process of what we call phagocytosis, so the gobbling up the immune, immune cells do of foreign bodies. And so, um, and so he was, he was a brilliant father of immunology, you know, brilliant guy. Uh, and maybe as happens some, or actually quite a lot of great scientists later on in their careers, they can start to come up with crazy ideas. <laughs> and Metchnikoff was really full of crazy ideas. Uh, most of them complete nonsense. But one of the things that he, he when he turned 50, which in, at the turn of the last century was you were getting old. He got started to get worried about aging, and he started getting worried about his own his own mortality. And he really was getting, you know, wondering why. Uh, how can I do something about this? And so he started looking around in populations where people seem to live longer and healthier. And this brought him to parts of what's now rural Bulgaria. And it, what he found was that people who lived there ate, uh, uh, that lived longer, uh, ate a lot of fermented foods containing lactic acid bacteria. Mm. So he put forward the idea over 100 years ago that it was healthy aging could be driven by lactic acid bacteria and is really the father of probiotics. And, you know, if you go to Korea, you can get a, a yogurt drink with Metchnikoff's picture on it. So, you know, it must have that Nobel sign of approval. It must be good for you. But anyway, uh, as I say, most of what he talked about was nonsense. And so he was ignored. And most of this was ignored for 80 years. But you can read about it. He wrote a book about it, about the uh, uh, you know, optimistic studies on, on, on aging. Uh, and and it, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because sometimes in science, we, we uh, you know, are just reinventing wheels that have been turned already. We're, we're inventing them with technologies now that can advance that. So Metchnikoff then is a the father of lactic acid bacteria and probiotics. And so he's well known if you're an immunologist or a microbiologist. I, I'd never heard of him until I started reading uh, these studies as a neuroscientist, but um, it, 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 buoyed by the studies from my colleagues here in Cork uh, on the people in the nursing homes, uh, and with this Metchnikov idea, we started revisit. What, I wrote a paper called "Revisiting Metchnikov," which was really about looking at using aged animals, mice in this case. We looked at what's going on in their brains, what's going on in their um, their uh, behavior, and how is that linked to what's going on in their microbiome. And we found quite a number of what I would 
correlations, but it's just correlations. Mm -hmm. So it, it matched kind of what we were seeing in the human studies that the microbiome seems to correlate with some of the behavioral changes and with some of the some of the uh, uh, brain changes. But we needed to go one step further, and so in a study that we followed it up with, we said, could we target the microbiome um, in aging and through diet would be the best way? Uh, and could we slow down some of the effects of aging? And so we used a diet that was um, enriched in inulin. Now, inulin is a fiber present in lots of vegetables, chicory, leeks, uh, artichokes, uh, etc. And uh, what? And for these studies, then I turned to uh, middle-aged mice because I started getting very interested in the middle-aged brain myself for obvious reasons. And uh, there, already in middle-aged mice, you start to see neuroinflammation happening in the brain as a harbinger of later, uh, perhaps degeneration. And so, what we found was when we fed the animals this inulin-enriched diet, that they didn't have this neuroinflammation in their brains, and that was really cool because now we see that by feeding microbes, we could actually slow down the effects of aging. But we, it wasn't definitive in terms of the diet could be having direct effects on the brain, independent of the microbiome. How do you know? How did I know? And, the, you know, I was asked this question many times. How do you know it's the microbes? So that led to the study that you're alluding to, which was this kind of killer study that we wanted to do, which was kind of a proof of concept. Well, what if we took the microbes from young animals and gave them to older animals, which have a different microbiome, could we reverse? Now, this was the real killer part of it because we went to old animals, 22 month old animals. Could we reverse the effects of aging on brain behavior and immunity? And that was really, you know, an experiment that I told the postdoc, this is not going to work. You know, <laughs> we, we have to do it. Uh, and so we took advantage of fecal transplants approach, which you alluded to, which is exactly what it says on the 10. It means taking something, some other individual's poo and transplanting it. In this case, it's from one mouse to another. And um, I'll just stall and, and just explain to your listeners what fecal transplants uh, have got some attention in the press over the years. Um, and, and they're seen as something quite new, but they go back to ancient China uh, and the, where they were used in the treat, treatment of, um, uh, of, of all sorts of ailments. It was called a yellow soup uh, uh, in Chinese medicine. Um, and uh, they've been revelationary in modern medicine in treating certain forms of infection, most notably Clostridium difficile. C. diff kills people, and it's antibiotic-induced uh, uh, infection. And what studies from um, the Netherlands almost 10 years ago, again, showed that uh, there was a 95% uh, success rate uh, in uh, individuals that had been given a fecal transplant uh, for this in, in infection. And so I'm, you know, I, I I work in a medical school. There aren't that many areas of medicine where you can say there's 95% success rate for anything.